So, we're here today with Professors Sandeep and Shaila Shastri. We've just enjoyed two fabulous lectures on the anniversary of Gandhi's birth. It's the 145th anniversary today, a momentous day for us and a very special day, of course, back in India. Um, for people who didn't have the pleasure of hearing your lecture today, could you tell us um, in the essence of what you wanted to communicate to your audiences today? The focus of the uh, dialogue I had with my audience today was basically this question that uh, 66 years after Gandhi passed away, uh, what is his uh, relevance or how does a new generation of people in India and across the world uh, look at his contribution? Mm -hmm. uh, the two pillars of his philosophy were truth and nonviolence and how much and to what extent, with what intensity, does that still resonate in the lives and minds of people? Yeah. And I was sharing with my audience as to how uh, international leaders of the world today, be it uh, uh, Nelson Mandela and De Klerk, or be it Aung Suu Kyi in Burma, how they have believed that their approach to politics, their approach to change in their own countries was very strongly influenced by the message of Gandhi. Uh, I also was discussing the point that how a new generation in India uh, reflects on the message of Gandhi and tries to internalize that message in the light of their own lived experience. Uh, protesting against social injustice, uh, protesting against social ostracization, uh, making your voice heard against uh, crime and corruption, uh, in the Gandhian way, if you may, yes, which is yes. silent, non-violent protest, where uh, you put the onus of proof on the other side for showing any change. Because you are non-violent, mm -hmm. you stand for the truth, you believe in a peaceful protest, which puts immense pressure on the other side to respond to this tactic used. And increasingly, young people in India and also in other parts of the world are realizing that maybe the solution to a lot of problems of the world lie in this strategy and in this thing. This is something that we're seeing in Hong Kong at the moment as yes. well, isn't it? Yes. In fact, if you look at the protests which have hung, happened in Hong Kong in the last few days, the students have shown tremendous resilience. Mm -hmm. The students have shown great patience. The students have also demonstrated the strength of their commitment yes, to a absolutely. position. You see, all three were the hallmarks of Gandhi's strategy, uh, where you know that your whole movement need not necessarily be nonviolent. Mm -hmm. What you bring into the movement is nonviolence. It could be met by violence from the other side, which requires great capacity not to respond in the same way. Absolutely. And I think the uh, young people in Hong Kong are clearly, clearly demonstrating the effect of that. Absolutely. And uh, Shaila, um, your lecture was very much about creativity and education as well, wasn't it? But Gandhi's words obviously resonate throughout education as well, don't they? Yes, I brought into the discussion that the classrooms, I, I mean, I was looking at two things, creativity and not innovation. And creativity in the classroom, which is under the control of can be handled by a teacher. Mm -hmm. And what happens in the classroom is three things are happening, especially, uh, I think it's a phenomenon with the world over, and especially in, from the country that we come from. Um, the first is the impact of globalization. Yeah. Just a few years back, I wouldn't have thought that I would have students from across the world in my classroom, just a matter of 15 years earlier. And now today, my lectures or any uh, faculty teaching that domain has to uh, dovetail the, and understand the needs of people from different cultures, the impact of globalization. The second is the impact of technology, the revo revolution that is happening. Mm -hmm. And students are connected online and we have the internet facilities, we have social media. And so the classroom is changing because of the media and there is so much that a teacher has to unlearn 
and relearn and reconnect yeah. and make a lot of effort, creative effort to connect to the students in the contemporary uh, classroom. And the third thing is how notions of uh, the concept of learning, the concept of intelligence itself has changed. Mm -hmm. And I come from a background of psychology. So how the new concept of intelligence, no more it is viewed as a crystallized concept. It is fluid. You, know, you can change your intelligence. Yeah. The more you can incorporate experiences and learn through your experiences. Now how classrooms therefore can provide these very constructive experiences to build on the knowledge of the, not just the student, but the teacher himself or herself. So this is what I discussed. And uh, what I also took the, uh, the point is, there are three things that need to be changed because of this. One is how you utilize the content that we transact in the classroom. No more a teacher is just an information giver. Yeah. They have access to information student. But we need, we have an additional responsibility of converting this information into knowledge and uh, share this knowledge. And how do we do that? So can we utilize the uh, content as a medium to make our students think at higher levels, to respect other cultures, to collaborate with different diverse opinions and ideas? So content just becomes a medium. So it's not the burden of the content, no. but more providing wings to students, utilizing content. That's the first point that I... Uh, like yes. I, and two more issues, the way forward is having a relook at the entire concept of assessment and evaluation in education. What are we assessing our students for? Is it assessment of learning? or assessment for learning yeah. and I think in today's world where uh, research has shown that students love and understand and learn a lot from feedback, how assessment for learning is catching up. No more it is uh, assessment of learning, how much of uh, information you have mastered, that's not what we are looking at. That's the second point and finally how the role of the teacher it's, has changed. No more, it's just a teacher. We are more of facilitators of this sure. process of learning. Yeah. And in turn, the biggest benef uh, beneficiary in this is the teacher himself or herself. Because it's a space of interesting learning dynamics. That's very interesting what you were saying about how you see the teacher and the student as both being in a learning process. Yes. And as a teacher, you know, you're learning from your students and your students are learning from you and they're learning from each other. So it's a much more holistic way of yes. um, that sort of relationship. Um, it's something that we believe in very strongly at the University of Bolton, so it's fabulous to listen and hear those messages from you in such a natural way. And of course, you're here with us because one of our students um, used to be one of your students. Yes. And you clearly like continue that sort of relationship together now, don't you? Oh yes, uh, I think one of the fascinating advantages of this, of being in this profession, is wherever you go, whichever part of the world you tend to travel in, you would not be surprised if somebody walked up to you and asked you, are you not Professor Shastri? Mm. So we have our stu students all over the world and uh, and I think one of the fascinating aspects of being in this profession is you get to meet them and they tell you about how much progress they have made and tell you about uh, what they achieved in life, which is an important input for you when yeah. you go back to your classroom the very next day. And as I said, one such student is here with you at Bolton. Uh, Chaturika did her uh, master's in psychology with us. Mm -hmm. And we are very proud that she was a rank student with us. And uh, uh, during the two years she was in the master's program, she was uh, somebody we considered a very important asset. She involved herself in a range of internships. She helped the university in a lot of its uh, collaborative research. And then has come to Bolton to pursue her uh, research even further. 
and that link continues that fact that she was with us at Absolutely. some point of time and that has allowed this link to be established between two universities at two different parts of the world. Which we hope we will continue. Oh yes, for sure, for sure. Um, but of course Gandhi has a link with Bolton as well, doesn't he? Because he, he has been to Bolton. So how did you feel about delivering your lectures today given that you know, Gandhi has had experience about that? Yes, as well? I, I, it was the September of 1931 where uh, Gandhi happened to come to this region and it was in very interesting circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, he was invited here to speak to mill workers mm -hmm. and negotiate with mill owners because a lot of uh, mill owners in this region felt that his uh, boycott movement in India, boycott of foreign goods movement in India had adversely affected the, the business prospects of the textile mills in this region. And it was a very delicate situation he came in. Mm -hmm. uh, he stood his ground and said, no, there are issues in India which I need to deal with and I cannot go back on my stand of uh, boycott. But in spite of that, uh, he had a very, very warm dialogue with people. And uh, on both sides, I think there was a sense of uh, having taken away something may not be in terms of positive results, but in terms of human relationships. And I think that's what, uh, uh, as a student of, uh, of Gandhi's life and writings, one lesson that I've constantly taken away from his writings is uh, challenge the act. Yeah. Don't question the doer of the act. Uh, he had great relations with the, with the people who did the act. I still remember a case where uh, a court held him guilty of violating a law. And the judge told him, Mr. Gandhi, you have violated a law. And Mr. Gandhi stood up and said, my lord, I agree I have violated your law. But then there is a greater law which rules all our lives, which is a human law, which I want to uphold. And the judge replied saying, that greater law you talk about is unfortunately not under my control. I deal with only this law, so I have to hold you guilty. And Gandhi bowed his head and accepted it. And people tell me that the two individuals were the best of, uh, they had the best of relationship with one another, even though they differed on a critical matter. And I think that's one learning which all of us could do a lot of good with. Absolutely. That uh, if we do not translate our differences of opinion with people into differences of opinion with people. We are differing on their opinions, but we are not differing as individuals. Yes. If that separation of that is maintained, which leaders like Mandela and Klerk de Klerk did uh, when they fought those very tedious negotiations of moving South Africa to a post-apartheid regime, I think that's, that's a great lesson that uh, can be learned. That, uh, differ on issues, but don't necessarily differ at the human level. I can connect it to the lecture that I gave and okay. what I strongly believe in a classroom. It's no different in a classroom. What we strongly believe is separate the deed and the doer. Yeah. So when you are a facilitator, when uh, as a teacher you're more of a facilitator, I think one thing becomes very critical. When you see students behaving in certain ways which you don't really approve of, I think there has to be a disconnect in the mind between the deed and the doer. I do not like your action. That doesn't mean that I don't like you. Yeah. I think that's exactly the point that we need to incorporate in the classrooms also. And maybe in our coaches and yes, society. Absolutely. And absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And it's such an enriching experience, the experience today to teach a uh, group of culturally diverse group and come out of it very enriched. There is this adage of this very famous sportspersons who say, I may have many opponents on the field, but I don't have any enemies. <laughs> At the end of the day, we are all together. And that's how we should think about life. Well, thank you very much for that update on your lectures for those people who not the opportunity to enjoy them. I hope you've enjoyed your visit. It's to the been University. brilliant here. Brilliant. A lot of friends have told me that uh, you have brought the sunlight from India to Bolton. <laughs>
because the last two days have been very sunny and that's <laughs> nice but then uh, I think we also are taking away with us back to India the warmth of the people who we have met here and that's something which is going to be very comforting and something which is going to remain with us for long. I, I, I think from the time we uh, landed at the uh, railway station till I think at till this moment, we have been filled with so much of the. I, I mean, I we felt at home. It was just so oh, much of love and affection, and warmth. But it's lovely yeah. to hear. I think it's such a pleasure. <laughs> oh, it's very great pleasure to have had you here with us today. Mm -hmm.